And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Soothe to Sleep Stories. I'm your host, Lonnie Brock, and I thought this episode would be a little bit unique for you because it will be about, well, what the Jewish feast of Purim or Purim or Purim, however it's pronounced, depending on where you are from, well, what it's all about. And it just concluded. So I wanted to share a little bit about it. Now you can Google and look up excellent teachings and historical information on the Purim holiday and why it is significant to continue to celebrate to this day. And for those of you who may not know, the Lord led me on my journey back to him as a prodigal daughter about 2010. I grew up in the church. I had received him as a little girl as my Lord and Savior, and I remember it like it was yesterday. I was only about five years old. And after my father, my precious father died, February 25th, 1991, when I was 17 years old, my faith that had sort of been dependent on the coattails of my parents was completely crushed. And it took quite some time for me to return to the Lord fully surrendered, and that was in 2010. I did have some hiccups along the way, but on my journey, the Lord met me where I was, and I was impressed to begin to research and study the history of Christianity, which is Judaism. And as I began to celebrate the major and minor feasts of Judaism annually, I cannot tell you how much deeper and what wonder filled my heart, my soul, and my life. It felt like I was experiencing what Jesus experienced when he was on earth for he celebrated the feasts as well. And one of them, some speculate, was the minor feast of Purim, because in the Gospel of John, it mentions a feast, but it doesn't specify which feast it was. However, when scholars go back to the historical times and discover between 25 and 28, B.C., that feast of Purim was celebrated at that location. So I don't think it would be too extravagant to suggest that Jesus also grew up celebrating and honoring the feast of Purim. For he honored the feast of Hanukkah, and that was after the Tanakh had been completed between the silent years, during the silent years, between the Tanakh or the Old Testament and the Brit Hadash, uh, the Brit Hadasha or Brit Hadasha, depending on where you're from, how it's pronounced, the New Testament. So between the Old and the New, you had the silent years, and during that time, Hanukkah was formed. And Yeshua HaMashiach, or Jesus Christ, celebrated that when he was on the earth, as documented in the Gospels. So without further ado, I'm going to read 10 or 10 chapters of Esther, and I'm going to include additions that were paraphrased by Albert J. Nevins of the Living Bible Version. He was the editor-in-chief 
and he was also the corporate vice president of Our Sunday Visitor Incorporated. And so let's begin the book of Esther, A1. In the second year of the reign of King Ahasuerus the Great, in the first day of the month of Nisan, Mordecai, the son of Jayud, son of Shemai, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, had a dream. He was a Jew living in the city of Susa, a great man among the leaders of the king's court. He was one of the captives whom Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar, depending on where you're from, how it's pronounced. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon and had taken away from Jerusalem with Jeconiah, king of Judea, and this was Mordecai's dream. Quote, Behold, clamor and confusion, thunders and earthquakes, tumult upon the earth. And behold, two great dragons came forward, ready to fight one another. At their cry, every nation girded for war, to do battle against the nation of the just. It was a day of darkness and gloom, of tribulation and distress, and of great fear upon the earth. The nation of the just was troubled, fearing the evils that threatened, and was ready to die. The people cried to God, and as they were crying, as though from a small spring, there grew a very great river with a flood of waters. The light of the sun broke out, and the humble were exalted, and they devoured the nobles. When Mordecai had dreamed this, he arose from his bed and was thinking what God would do. He kept turning it about in his mind, anxious to know what the dream meant. Section A2 At that time, he lived at the king's court with Gabatha and Thara, the king's eunuchs, who were guards of the palace. He overheard them plotting, investigated their plans, and learned that they were about to lay violent hands on King Ahasuerus. He told the king of this. Then the king had them both examined, and after they had confessed, commanded them to be put to death. The king made a record of what was done, and Mordecai also wrote down the events. The king ordered him to serve in the court and gave him a reward. But Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, was in great honor with the king, and he sought to harm Mordecai, or Mordechai, depending on where you're from, how it's pronounced, and his people because of the two eunuchs of the king who were put to death. Chapter 1 it was the third year of the reign of King Ahasuerus, emperor of vast Medea Persia, with its 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. This was the year of the great celebration at Shushan Palace, to which the emperor invited all his governors, aides, and army officers, bringing them in from every part of Media Persia for the occasion. The celebration lasted six months, a tremendous display of the wealth and glory of his empire. When it was all over, the king gave a special party for the palace servants and officials, the janitors and cabinet officials alike, for seven days of revelry held in the courtyard of the palace garden. 
The decorations were green, white, and blue, fastened with purple ribbons tied to silver rings embedded in marble pillars. Gold and silver benches stood on pavements of black, red, white, and yellow marble. Drinks were served in golden goblets of many designs, and there was an abundance of royal wine, for the king was feeling very generous. The only restriction on the drinking was that no one should be compelled to take more than he wanted, but those who wished could have as much as they pleased. For the king had instructed his officers to let everyone decide this matter for himself. Queen Vashti gave a party for the women of the palace at the same time. On the final day, when the king was feeling high, half drunk from wine, he told the seven eunuchs who were his personal aides, Mehuman, Bitsta, Harbona, Bikta, Abagata, Zetar, and Karkas to bring Queen Vashti to him with the royal crown upon her head so that all the men could gaze upon her beauty for she was a very beautiful woman. But when they conveyed the emperor's order to Queen Vashti, she refused to come. The king was furious, but first consulted his lawyers, for he did nothing without their advice. They were men of wisdom, who knew the temper of the times, as well as Persian law and justice, and the king trusted their judgment. These men were Karshina, Shethar, Armata, Tarshish, Meres, Marasena, and Memukan, seven high officials of Medea Persia. They were his personal friends, as well as being the chief officers of the government. What shall we do about this situation? he asked them. What penalty does the law provide? For a queen who refuses to obey the king's orders properly sent through his aides. Memu Khan answered for the others. Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but every official and citizen of your empire. For women everywhere will begin to disobey their husbands when they learn what Queen Vashti has done. And before this day is out, the wife of every one of us officials throughout your empire will hear what the queen did and will start talking to us husbands the same way. And there will be contempt and anger throughout your realm. We suggest that, subject to your agreement, you issue a royal edict, a law of the Medes and Persians, that can never be changed, that Queen Vashti be forever banished from your presence, and that you choose another queen more worthy than she. When this decree is published throughout your great kingdom, husbands everywhere, whatever their rank, will be respected by their wives. The king and all his aides thought this made good sense. So he followed Memu Khan's counsel and sent letters to all of his provinces in all the local languages, stressing that every man should rule his home and should assert his authority. Hope you don't mind the page turning and page Yes, having to turn pages, because hopefully you're opening up your Bibles and reading this along with me. Okay, chapter two. But after King Ahasuerus' anger had cooled, he began brooding over the loss of Ashdai, realizing that he would never see her again. 
so as AIDS suggested. Let us go and find the most beautiful girls in the empire and bring them to the king for his pleasure. We will appoint agents in each province to select young lovelies for the royal harem. Hegai, the eunuch in charge, will see that they are given beauty treatments and after that, the girl who pleases you most shall be the queen instead of Vestai. This suggestion naturally pleased the king very much and he put the plan into immediate effect. Now there was a certain Jew at the palace named Mordechai, son of Jair, son of Shammai, son of Kish, a Benjamite. He had been captured when Jerusalem was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar and had been exiled to Babylon along with King Jeconiah of Judah and many others. This man had a beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadassah, also called Esther, whose father and mother were dead, and whom he had adopted into his family and raised as his own daughter. So now, as a result of the king's decree, Esther was brought to the king's harem at Shushan Palace, along with many other young girls. Haggai, who was responsible for the harem, was very much impressed with her and did his best to make her happy. He ordered a special menu for her, favored her for the beauty treatments, gave her seven girls from the palace as her maids, and gave her the most luxurious apartment in the harem. Esther hadn't told anyone that she was a Jewess, for Mordechai had said not to. He came daily to the court of the harem to ask about Esther and to find out what was happening to her. The instructions concerning these girls were that before being taken to the king's bed, each would be given six months of beauty treatments with oil of myrrh followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments. Then, as each girl's turn came for spending the night with King Ahasuerus, she was given her choice of clothing or jewelry she wished to enhance her beauty. She was taken to the king's apartment in the evening and the next morning returned to the second harem where the king's wives lived. There she was under the care of Shash Gats, another of the king's eunuchs, who lived there the rest of her life, never seeing the king again unless he had especially enjoyed her and called her for her by name. When it was Esther's turn to go to the king, she accepted the advice of Hegai, the eunuch in charge of the harem, dressing according to his instructions. And all the other girls exclaimed with delight when they saw her. So Esther was taken to the palace of the king in January of the seventh year of his reign. Well, the king loved Esther more than any of the other girls. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Ashtai. To celebrate the occasion, he threw another big party for all his officials and servants, giving generous gifts to everyone and making grants to the provinces in the form of a remission of taxes. Later, the king demanded a second bevy of beautiful girls. By that time, Mordecai had become a government official. Esther still had not told anyone she was a Jewess for she was still following Mordechai's orders, just as she had in his home. One day, as Mordechai was on duty at the palace, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigdan and Teresh, who were guards at the palace gate, became angry at the king and plotted to assassinate him. Mordechai heard about it and passed on the information to Queen Esther, who told the king, crediting Mordechai with the information. An investigation was made 
the two men found guilty and impaled alive. This was all duly recorded in the book of the history of King Ahasuerus' reign. Chapter 3 Soon afterwards, King Ahasuerus appointed Haman, son of Hamidatha the Agagite, as prime minister. He was the most powerful official in the empire, next to the king himself. Now all the king's officials bowed before him in deep reverence whenever he passed by, for so the king had commanded. But Mordechai refused to bow. Why are you disobeying the king's commandment? The others demanded day after day, but he still refused. Finally, they spoke to Haman about it to see whether Mordechai could get away with it because of his being a Jew, which was the excuse he had given them. Haman was furious, but decided not to lay hands on Mordechai alone, but to move against all of Mordechai's people, the Jews, and destroy all of them throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. The most propitious time for this action was determined by throwing dice. This was done in April of the 12th year of the reign of Ahasuerus, and February of the following year was the date indicated. Haman now approached the king about the matter. Quote, There is a certain race of people scattered through all the provinces of your kingdom, he began and their laws are different from those of any other nation, and they refuse to obey the king's laws. Therefore, it is not in the king's interest to let them live. If it please the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed, and I will pay twenty thousand dollars into the royal treasury. Really, it says $20 million. I'm not sure if that's correct. But a big amount into the royal treasury for the expenses involved in this purge. It says $20 million in our day. So, okay, that's how much he pledged to give. For the purge, verse 10. The king agreed, confirming his decision by removing his ring from his finger and giving it to Haman, telling him, Keep the money, but go ahead and do as you like with these people, whatever you think best. Two or three weeks later, Haman called in the king's secretaries and dictated letters to the governors and officials throughout the empire, to each province in its own languages and dialects. These letters were signed in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with his ring. They were then sent by messengers into all the provinces of the empire, decreeing that the Jews, young and old, women and children, must all be killed on the 28th day of February of the following year and their property given to those who killed them. That is, the thirteenth day of Adad. Section B1 This is a copy of the letter Ahasuerus, the great king who reigns from India to Ethiopia, to the princes and governors of the 127 provinces which are subject to his empire. Greetings. Whereas I rule over many nations and have brought all the world under my dominion, I am not willing to abuse the greatness of my power, but choose to govern my subjects with clemency and kindness, that they may live quietly without any fear and might enjoy peace which is desired by all men. When I asked my counselors how this might be accomplished, Haman, who excels the rest in wisdom and fidelity and is second only after the king, told me that there is a people scattered throughout all the nations which uses laws contrary to those of all nations. 
despises the commandments of kings and violates by their opposition our attempt to unify our kingdom. Therefore, having noted this and observing one nation in opposition to all mankind, using perverse laws, going against our commandments, and disturbing the peace and concord of the provinces subject to us, we have commanded that all marked out by Haman, who is chief over all the provinces, second after the king and whom we honor as a father, shall be utterly destroyed by their enemies, together with their wives and children, and that none shall have pity on them. This is to happen on the fourteenth day of the twelfth month of Adar, of this present year, so that these wicked men going down to hell in one day may restore to our empire the peace which they have disturbed. End of the letter. Verse 14 of chapter 3. A copy of this edict, the letter stated, must be proclaimed as law in every province and made known to all your people so that they will be ready to do their duty on the appointed day. The edict went out by the king's speediest couriers after being first proclaimed in the city of Shushan. Then the king and Haman sat down for a drinking spree as the city fell into confusion and panic. Chapter 4 When Mordecai learned what had been done, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. Then he stood outside the gate of the palace for no one was permitted to enter in mourning clothes. And throughout all the provinces there was great mourning among the Jews, fasting, weeping, and despair at the king's decree, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordechai, she was deeply distressed and sent clothing to him to replace the sackcloth, but he refused it. Then Esther sent for Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed as her attendant, and told him to go out to Mordecai and find out what the trouble was and why he was acting like that. So Hadach went out to the city square and found Mordecai just outside the palace gates and heard the whole story from him and about the amount Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Mordechai also gave Hathach a copy of the king's decree, dooming all Jews, and told him to show it to Hadassah, that is, to Esther, and to tell her what was happening, and that she should go to the king to plead for her people. So Hathach returned to Esther with Mordechai's message. Esther told Hathach to go back and say to Mordechai, all the world knows that anyone, whether man or woman, who goes into the king's inner court without his summons is doomed to die unless the king holds out his golden scepter and the king has not called for me to come to him in more than a month. So Hathach gave Esther's message to Mordechai. This was Mordechai's reply to Esther. Do you think you will escape there in the palace when all the other Jews are killed? If you keep quiet at a time like this, God will deliver the Jews from some other source that you and your relatives will die. What's more, who can say but that God has brought you into the palace for just such a time?
as this. Then Esther said to tell Mordechai, Go and gather together all the Jews of Shushan and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my maids will do the same. And then, though it is strictly forbidden, I will go in to see the king. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordechai did as Esther told him to. Section C1 But Mordechai besought the Lord, recalling all his works, and said, O Lord, Lord, almighty king, all affairs are in your power, and there is none who can resist your will if you determine to save Israel. You have made heaven and earth, and all things that are under the dome of heaven. You are Lord of all, and there is none who can resist your majesty. You know all things, and you know that it was not out of pride and contempt, or any desire of glory, that I refused to grovel before the proud Haman. For I would willingly and readily for the salvation of Israel have kissed even the soles of his feet, but I did this that I should not place the glory of a man before the glory of my God. And lest I should adore anyone except my God. And now, O Lord, O King, O God of Abraham, have mercy on your people, because our enemies resolve to destroy us and wipe out your inheritance. Despise not your portion, which you have redeemed for yourself out of Egypt. Hear my supplication, and be merciful to your lot and inheritance, and turn our mourning into joy, that we may live and praise your name. O Lord, do not close the mouths of those who sing to you. And all Israel, with like mind and supplication, cried to the Lord, because they saw certain death hanging over their heads. Section C2 Queen Esther, fearing the danger that was at hand, also had recourse to the Lord. Taking off her royal apparel, she put on garments suitable for weeping and mourning. Instead of various precious ointments, she covered her head with ashes and dung and humbled her body by fasting. All the places which she was accustomed to adorn, she covered with her tangled hair. She prayed to the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, O oh, my Lord, who alone are our king, help me, a desolate woman who is no other helper but you. I am taking my life in my hands. I have heard from my father that you, O oh Lord, did take Israel from among all nations and our fathers from all their predecessors to possess them as an everlasting inheritance, and you have done to them as you have promised. We have sinned in your sight, and therefore you have delivered us into the hands of our enemies, because we have worshipped their gods. You are just, O Lord. Now our enemies are not content to oppress us with the most difficult bondage, but attributing their power to the strength of their idols, they plan to change your promises, destroy your inheritance, close the mouths of those who praise you, and also extinguish the glory of your temple and altar. This, so that they may open the mouths of Gentiles, praise the strength of idols, and magnify forever a carnal king. Give not, O oh Lord, your scepter to those who do not exist. Do not let them laugh at our ruin, but turn their plan against themselves and destroy the man who has begun to rage against us. 
Remember, O oh Lord, show yourself to us in the time of our tribulation and give me boldness, O oh Lord, King of gods and of all power. Put eloquent words in my mouth in the presence of the lion and turn his heart to hate our enemy so that both he himself may perish and the rest who agree with him. But deliver us by your hand and help me who has no other helper but you, O Lord, who has the knowledge of all things. You know that I hate the glory of the wicked and abhor the bed of the uncircumcised and of any foreigner. You know my necessity that I abominate the sign of my pride and glory which is upon my head in the days of my public appearance and detest it as a menstruous rag and wear it not in the days of my leisure. I have not eaten at Haman's table nor has the king's banquet pleased me nor have I drunk the wine of the libations. Your handmaid has never rejoiced since I was brought hither unto this day, but in you, O Lord, God of Abraham. O God, who are mighty above all, hear the voice of those who have no other hope and deliver us from the hand of the wicked and deliver me from my fear. Chapter 5 Three days later, Esther put on her royal robes and entered the inner court just beyond the royal hall of the palace where the king was sitting upon his royal throne. And when he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her, holding out the golden scepter to her. So Esther approached and touched its tip. Section D1. On the third day, she laid away the garments she wore and put on splendid apparel. Glittering in royal robes, she took two maids with her after she had called upon God, the ruler and savior of all, and leaned daintily upon one of them with great delicacy as if she were unable to bear her own weight. The other maid followed her lady, carrying her flowing train. The rosy color of her face and her bright and sparkling eyes hid a mind full of anguish and very great fear. She passed through all the doors of the court and stood before the king. He sat upon his royal throne, clothed in his royal robes, shining with gold and precious stones. He was terrifying to behold. Looking up, his burning eyes revealed the wrath in his heart. The queen sank down. Her color turned pale, and she rested her weary head upon her handmaid. Then God changed the king's spirit into gentleness. Quickly and with concern, he hurried from his throne and lifted her up in his arms until she came to herself. He comforted her with these words. What is the matter, Esther? I am your brother. Fear not. You shall not die. For this law is not made for you, but for all others. Come near and touch the scepter. And as she held her peace, he took the golden scepter and laid it upon her neck, kissed her, and asked, Why do you not speak to me? She answered, I saw you, my lord as an angel of God, and my heart was troubled for fear of your glory. For you, my Lord, are very admirable, and your face is full of grace. While she was speaking, she fell down again, almost in a swoon. 
the king was troubled and all his servants comforted her. Verse 3 of chapter 5. Then the king asked her, What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? I will give it to you even if it is half the kingdom. And Esther replied, If it please your majesty, I want you and Haman to come to a banquet I prepared for you today. The king turned to his aides. Tell Haman to hurry, he said. So the king and Haman came to Esther's banquet. During the wine course, the king said to Esther, Now tell me what you really want, and I will give it to you, even if it it is half the kingdom. Esther replied, My request, my deepest wish, is that if your majesty loves me and wants to grant my request, that you come again with Haman tomorrow to the banquet I shall prepare for you. And tomorrow I will explain what this is all about. What a happy man was Haman as he left the banquet. But when he saw Mordechai there at the gate, not standing up or trembling before him, he was furious. However, he restrained himself and went on home and gathered together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, and boasted to them about his wealth and his many children and promotions the king had given him and how he'd become the greatest man in the kingdom next to the king himself. Then he delivered his final punchline. Yes, and Esther the queen invited only me and the king himself to the banquet she prepared for us, and tomorrow we are invited again. But yet, he added, All this is nothing when I see Mordechai the Jew just sitting there in front of the king's gate, refusing to bow to me. Well, suggested Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, get ready a 75-foot high gallow, and in the morning ask the king to let you hang Mordecai on it, and when this is done, you can go on your merry way with the king to the banquet. This pleased him on immensely, and he ordered the gallows. Chapter 6 That night, the king had trouble sleeping and decided to read a while. He ordered the historical records of his kingdom from the library, and in them he came across the item telling how Mordechai had exposed the plot of Bigdana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, watchmen at the palace gates, who had plotted to assassinate him. What reward did we ever give Mordechai for this? The king asked. His courtiers replied, Nothing. Who is on duty in the outer court? The king inquired. Now, as it happened, Haman had just arrived in the outer court of the palace to ask the king to hang Mordechai from the gallows he was building. So the courtiers replied to the king, Haman is out there. Bring him in, the king ordered. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? Haman thought to himself, Whom would he want to honor more than me? So he replied, Bring out some of the royal robes the king himself has worn, and the king's own horse, and the royal crown, and instruct one of the king's most noble princes to rope the man, and to lead him through the streets on the king's own horse, shouting before him, This is the way. The king honors those who truly please him. Excellent, the king said to Haman. Hurry and take these robes and my horse, and do just as you have said to Mordecai the Jew, who works at the chancellery. Follow every detail you suggested. So Haman took the robes and put them on Mordecai and mounted him on the king's own steed 
and led him through the streets of the city, shouting, This is the way the king honors those he delights in. Afterwards, Mordechai returned to his job, but Haman hurried home, utterly humiliated. When Haman told Zadash his wife and all his friends what had happened, they said, If Mordechai is a Jew, you will never succeed in your plans against him. To continue to oppose them will be fatal. While they were still discussing it with him, the king's messengers arrived to conduct Haman quickly to the banquet Esther had prepared. Chapter 7 So the king and Haman came to Esther's banquet. Again, during the wine course, the king asked her, What is your petition, Queen Esther? What do you wish? Whatever it is, I will give it to you, even if it is half of my kingdom. And at last Queen Esther replied, If I have won your favor, O king, and if it please your majesty, save my life and the lives of my people, for I and my people have been sold to those who will destroy us. We are doomed to destruction and slaughter. If we were only to be sold as slaves, perhaps I could remain quiet, though even then there would be incalculable damage to the king that no amount of money could begin to cover. What are you talking about? King Osiris demanded. Who would dare touch you? Esther replied, This wicked Haman is our enemy. Then Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. The king jumped to his feet and went out into the palace garden as Haman stood up to plead for his life to Queen Esther, for he knew that he was doomed. In despair, he fell upon the couch where Queen Esther was reclining, just as the king returned from the palace garden. Will he even rape the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes? The king roared. Instantly, the death veil was placed over Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the king's aides, said, Sir, Haman has just ordered a 75 good gallows constructed to hang Mordechai, the man who saved the king from assassination. It stands in Haman's courtyard. Hang Haman on it, the king ordered. So they did, and the king's wrath was pacified. Chapter 8 On that same day, King Ahasuerus gave the estate of Haman, the Jew's enemy, to Queen Esther. Then Mordecai was brought before the king, for Esther had told the king that he was her cousin and foster father. The king took off his ring, which he had taken back from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai, appointing him prime minister. And Esther appointed Mordecai, to be in charge of Haman's estate. And now, once more, Esther came before the king, falling down at his feet and begging him with tears to stop Haman's plot against the Jews. And again, the king held out the golden scepter to Esther. So she arose and stood before him and said, If it please your majesty, and if you love me, send out a decree reversing Haman's order to destroy the Jews throughout the king's provinces, for how can I endure it to see my people butchered and destroyed? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, I have given Esther the palace of Haman, and he has been hanged upon the gallows because he tried to destroy you. Now go ahead and send a message to the Jews, telling them whatever you want to in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring so that it can never be reversed. Immediately, the king's secretaries were called in. It was now the 23rd day of the month of July, and they wrote as Mordecai dictated, a decree to the Jews and to the officials, governors and princes of all the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 
127 provinces in all. The decree was translated into the languages and dialects of all the people of the kingdom. Mordechai wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed the message with the king's ring and sent the letters by swift carriers, riders on camels, mules, and young dromedaries used in the king's service. This decree gave the Jews everywhere permission to unite the defense of their lives and their families to destroy all the forces opposed to them and to take their property. The day chosen for this throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus was the 28th day of February. And just note that sometimes it's the 25th day of February as it was in this year of 2021 or 5781 of the Jewish calendar. Section D2. The following is a copy of the letter. The great king Ahasuerus to the governors and princes from India to Ethiopia of the 127 provinces which obey our command. Greetings. Many have turned into pride the goodness of princes and the honor which has been bestowed upon them. They not only seek to oppress the king's subjects, but unable to enjoy the success given them, they have turned against their benefactors. Not only do they drive out gratitude from among men, but in violating the laws of humanity, they think they can also escape the justice of God who sees all things. Their madness is so great that they undermine by lies those who seek to carry out diligently the offices entrusted to them. They do it in such a way as to seem worthy of all men's praise. With false trickery, they deceive the ears of well-meaning princes who judge others by their own nature. Now this is proved both from ancient records and by the things which are done daily, which show how the good intentions of kings are made foul by the evil suggestions of certain men. Wherefore, we must provide for the peace of all the provinces. Neither must you think if we command different things that our choice is lightly made, because we make our decision according to the quality and necessity of times, as the need of the commonwealth requires, that you may more plainly understand what we say. Haman, the son of Hamadatha, a Macedonian both by choice and birth, and having no Persian blood, but by his cruelty betraying our goodness, was received as a guest by us. He found our humanity so great toward him that he was called our father and was bowed down to by all as second to the king. But he was so filled with arrogance that he strove to deprive us of our kingdom and our life. With unimagined craftiness and deceit, he has sought the destruction of Mordechai, by whose fidelity and good services our life was saved, and of Esther, the partner of our kingdom together with all their nation. He thought that after they were slain, he might work treason against us, who would be alone without friends and might transfer the kingdom of the Persians to the Macedonians. But we have found that the Jews who were slated to be slain by that most wicked man are blameless and on the contrary have just laws and are the children of the highest, greatest, and ever living God by whose direction the kingdom was given both to our fathers and to us and is so kept to this day. Therefore, know that those letters which he sent in our name are void and of no effect. For this crime, both he himself who devised it and all his household hang on gibbets before the gates of the city of Susa. God has repaid him as he deserved, but this edict, which we now send, will be published in all cities so that the Jews may freely follow their own laws. On the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is called Adad, you must aid them so that they may kill those who had prepared themselves to kill them. 
for the Almighty God has turned this day of sadness and mourning into one of joy for them. Hence, you will also count this day among other festival days and celebrate it with all joy, that it may also be known in times to come that all those who faithfully obey the Persians receive a worthy reward for their fidelity, but those who are traitors to their kingdom are destroyed for their wickedness. Let every province and city that will not be partaker of this solemnity perish by sword and fire, and be destroyed in such manner as to be made unbelievable, unlivable, both to men and beasts, as an example of punishment for contempt and disobedience. Verse 13 of chapter 8. It's further stated that a copy of this decree, which must be recognized everywhere as law, must be broadcast to all the people so that the Jews would be ready and prepared to overcome their enemies. So the mail went out swiftly. The mail did go out swiftly, carried by the king's couriers, and speeded by the king's commandment. The same decree was also issued at Shushan Palace. Then Mordechai put on the royal robes of blue and white, and the great crown of gold, with an outer cloak of fine linen and purple, and went out from the presence of the king through the city streets filled with shouting people. And the Jews had joy and gladness, and were honored everywhere, and in every city and province, as the king's decree arrived, the Jews were filled with joy and had a great celebration and declared a holiday, and many of the people of the land pretended to be Jews, for they feared what the Jews might do to them. Chapter 9 So on the 28th day of February, the day the two decrees of the king were to be put into effect, the day the Jews' enemies had hoped to vanquish them, though it turned out quite to the contrary. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the king's provinces to defend themselves against any who might try to harm them. But no one tried, for they were greatly feared. And all the rulers of the provinces, the governors, officials, and aides, helped the Jews for fear of Mordecai. For Mordecai was a mighty name in the king's palace, and his fame was known throughout all the provinces, for he had become more and more powerful. But the Jews went ahead on that appointed day and slaughtered their enemies. They even killed 500 men in Shushan. They also killed the 10 sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Jews' enemy. Parashandata, Dalton, Aspata, Parata, Adalia, Aridata, Parmashta, Arisai, Aridai, and Vaitsata. But they did not try to take Haman's property. Late that evening, when the king was informed of the number of those slain in Shushan, he called for Queen Esther. The Jews have killed 500 men in Shushan alone, he exclaimed, and also Haman's ten sons. If they have done that here, I wonder what has happened in the rest of the provinces. But now, what more do you want? It will be granted to you. Tell me, and I will do it. And Esther said, she said, If it please your majesty, let the Jews who are here at Shushan do again tomorrow as they have done today and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. So the, ten, so the king agreed, and the decree was announced at Shushan. And they hung up the bodies of Haman's ten sons. Then the Jews at Shushan gathered together the next day also, and killed three hundred more men, though again they took no property. Meanwhile, the other Jews throughout the king's provinces had gathered together and stood for their lives and destroyed all their enemies, killing 75,000 of those who hated them, but they did not take their goods. Throughout the provinces, this was done on the 28th day of February, and the next day they rested 
celebrating their victory with feasting and gladness. But the Jews at Shushan went on killing their enemies the second day also, and rested the next day with feasting and gladness. And so it is that the Jews in the unwalled villages throughout Israel to this day have an annual celebration on the second day when they rejoice and send gifts to each other. Mordechai wrote a history of all these events and sent letters to the Jews near and far throughout all the king's provinces, encouraging them to declare an annual holiday on the last days of the month to celebrate with feasting, gladness, and the giving of gifts this historic day when the Jews were saved from their enemies. When their sorrow was turned to gladness and their mourning into happiness. So the Jews adopted Mordechai's suggestion and began this annual custom. It was a great suggestion and as a reminder of the time when Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted to destroy them at the time determined by a throw of the dice and to remind them that when the matter came before the king, he issued a decree causing Haman's plot to boomerang, and he and his sons were hanged on the gallows. That is why this celebration is called Purim, because the word for throwing dice in Persian is Pur. All the Jews throughout the realm agreed to inaugurate this tradition and to pass it on to their descendants and to all who became Jews. They declared they would never fail to celebrate these two days at the appointed time each year. It would be an annual event from generation to generation, celebrated by every family throughout the countryside and cities of the empire so that the memory of what had happened would never perish from the Jewish race. Meanwhile, Queen Esther, daughter of Abihel, and later adopted by Mordechai the Jew, had written a letter throwing her full support behind Mordechai's letter, inaugurating his annual Feast of Purim. In addition, letters were sent to all the Jews throughout the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus with messages of goodwill and encouragement to confirm these two days annually as the Feast of Purim, decreed by both Mordechai the Jew and by Queen Esther. Indeed, the Jews themselves had decided upon this tradition as a remembrance of the time of their national fasting and prayer. So the commandment of Esther confirmed these dates and it was recorded as law. Chapter 10 King Ahasuerus not only laid tribute upon the mainland, but even on the islands of the sea his great deeds, and also the full account of the greatness of Mordechai and the honors given him by the king are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Medea and Persia. Mordechai the Jew was the prime minister with authority next to that of King Ahasuerus himself. He was, of course, very great among the Jews and respected by all his countrymen because he did his best for his people and was a friend at court for all of them. This is the E section. Mordechai said, God has done these things. I remember a dream that I had concerning these same things and nothing of it has been unfulfilled. The small spring which grew into a river and there was light and the sun and bountiful waters. The river is Esther, whom the king married and made queen. The two dragons are Haman and myself. The nations are those who assembled to destroy the name of the Jews. My nation is Israel, 
who cried to the Lord. And the Lord saved his people. He delivered us from all evils and has wrought great signs and wonders among the nations. He commanded that there should be two lots, one of the people of God and the other of all the nations. These lots came to the appointed day before God and among all nations, and the Lord remembered his people and had mercy on his inheritance. So these days will be observed in the month of Adar, on the fourteenth and fifteenth day of that month, and all the people will gather into one assembly in joy and gladness from generation to generation, forever among the people of Israel. And this is the last section, F, of chapter 10. In the fourth year of the reign of Ptolemy and Cleopatra, Josephus, who claimed to be a priest and a Levite, together with Ptolemy and his son, brought the above letter of Purim to Egypt, which they asserted was true and had been translated by Lysimachus, the son of Ptolemy, a resident of Jerusalem. So that concludes reading the book of Esther with these sections. I hope that you enjoyed this and may you be blessed. May we be aware of the Hamans of our lifetime and in our world. The Hamans that want to silence us because of our God, whom we bow down to, obey, and love. Blessings to you.